back. Hey, Brett, how's it going this week? Good, Ange. How are you? Pretty good. Well, that means it's another episode of Money in the Bank, the personal finance episode where we talk about all things related to personal finance. And on Wednesdays, we get a little weird. It's way normal Wednesday. (laughs) So I let you pick the topic again today. Wow. I'm scared. I'm making you do this topic. How about that? Last time, last time you picked the topic, we lost a lot of. That was on Weird Wednesday. This is is totally different. I forget. Now we're back to way normal Wednesday. (laughs) Way normal Wednesday. So do you have a trivia question for me this week? I do. I have a trivia question for you. Tables have turned, sucker. Um... (laughs) You're way too happy about this. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about, uh, well, you answer this first. Specifically, at the by the end of 2017, last time this data was captured, how much money was paid into the Patreon system? So, like, total paid into Patreon. Yeah, how many how many people donated money through Patreon to contributors and what? Yeah. I don't even know how many, like, creators use Patreon. So well, now uh, you know how I feel. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, hundred million. Uh, no, it's actually closer to a hundred and sixty-ish million. Okay, well, uh, I was in the right ballpark. No, uh, yeah, fifty percent off. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. I mean, but that's like a that's a ton of money. That like, is a ton of that's money that's going through that system. And so, what I want to talk about today was all of the different money being transacted through systems that are non-subscription, like people where money is being voluntarily spent to support, you know, people in other areas, right? Well, and this is an interesting one to me because while I, you know, watch a lot of content that is produced by people and I understand, I guess, the appeal of Patreon, it's a little bit hard for me to wrestle with because if you're paying each person that you get content from a uh, sum of money, I mean, I think about all the podcasts I listen to or all the YouTube videos I watch or all the musicians that I appreciate that might not be mainstream and, and do have Patreons, it just feels like I could end up spending a lot of money to support these individuals. And not that I don't think they deserve it. I think that's like a hard part about this argument. I do think that they deserve to get paid for their work but on the same token like it's a hard thing for me to come to terms with I guess right so I don't really have an opinion one way or the other what the right answer is in this model I just think it's fascinating and I think it's something that has like suddenly cropped up as something that a lot of money is being dumped into and Patreon is just one example right um, there's all kinds of these systems now. I mean, mm-hmm. Twitch does their own system where people are donating. YouTube is broken into this market that is, uh, you know, end-user sponsored revenue for their creators. Uh, right? There's different platforms that you can spend this money through. Right? It's just a, it's just a fascinating topic area for me. So I want to just kind of like throw some ideas out and, and talk about what what some of those things were. So. One of the one of the biggest trends that I think is supporting this right now and drove a lot of this adoption is, for probably a lot of people listening to this podcast don't realize, um, people are getting paid a ton of money now, or a ton of money is being poured in the systems to watch people play video games. So it's no longer the model of like you just buy a video game and you play it. Now kids today, right, if they can't play a game themselves, they'll spend hours and hours and hours or days watching people play games on YouTube just to see what would happen or to like follow that person. And like Twitch, I mean, that's the, that's the backbone of the Twitch network that Amazon owns now. Um, YouTube, uh, YouTube gaming was around for a long time, but I think YouTube's rolled that back in. Uh, now YouTube uh, is getting into the gaming market again with their gaming platform. Um, one of the features of which is the ability for people that are going to be playing these games to stream those games in 4K directly to YouTube for basically free, I think, is what the plan is there. Um, and obviously you have to pay for, like, the gaming service, and we don't know what that's going to cost yet, but uh, right, the ability to, like, just pump data streams into their network and have other people consume that was one of the core features of this architecture that they're building. And that's, like, interesting to me because... I can't imagine spending even an hour watching somebody play a video game. You don't like watching people play video games if they're in the same room as you. I, that's not <laughs> true. 
Like, I, I don't mind watching, like, I especially, like, being the little sister, I feel like I watched my siblings play a lot of video games as a kid. But, I mean, it's hard for me to watch anything for more than an hour, whether it's a video game or a movie. So I might be in the minority on that one. But it just feels like, yeah, especially watching somebody online play a game for hours. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of people that do get it and are, like, all in on it. So... I mean, and and you you can watch these um, you know these streamers, whether it's gamers, whether it's uh, people just getting on and talking about news, or people that are you know just getting on and doing any of these sponsored chats or anything like that. Um, you just get on there and you just watch people throwing like you know five dollars here, ten dollars here, like uh, you know hundred dollars here. Like they'll, I'll just occasionally just see like people just dropping in hundred dollar bills into these systems, and like you see it pop up on the screen because there's like a chat running, and like they're talking and like can like thank the people that are donating because like this big like thing will pop up on the screen that says like so and so donated whatever or became a subscriber and donated whatever be you know whatever comes with that. Um, and it's just like this crazy because it's like real dollars that are being transacted in these systems. But I think just beyond doing this for games, like you can, like there are people who are just creating content on YouTube that are doing something similar. That's what I mean. It's not, yeah, it's not just gamers. It's people on YouTube. It's people talking about news. It's people talking about uh, industry news. Like I know there's, I know there's a couple guys that talk about, I don't know, the latest like Nintendo Switch things. And I know every time that they have like a live video streaming podcast or whatever that they do, which is like a two hour long session. This is just one example. Um, right. The whole time there are people constantly donating to that stream Mm -hmm. and you just see people popping up and like, thank you for contributing. And like, you can donate more and they'll like read your comments like on the, the live stream and all that stuff. Right. And so there's, like, little incentive to, like, put money toward this. But really the incentive is, like, basically you supporting that creator. Right. Um, so it's, it's just an interesting paradigm to move away from what we have right now in the Internet is the ad-sponsored, you know, everything is, like, quote-unquote for free to the consumer model. And this is helping move in a direction where you're helping these people create content and helping – that they stop supporting as much on the ad revenue side and replace it with the content generating money. So, and I think side. with the ads, there's like two different types of ads, right? So for me, there's like, I'm watching YouTube and the video just has an ad and it is whatever YouTube decides to show me. And to me, that is like, maybe my right now preferred medium because I'm like, this is just an irrelevant ad. I can just skip it in five seconds and um, I actually looked up, uh, I, you know, I prepared a trivia question for you, but then you had one for me. So <laughs> I guess now I can just say this fun fact. But um, for each thousand views a video gets, there is between three to five dollars is paid out um, for, for having an ad air. So when you think of some YouTubers that have millions of views, that adds up very, very quickly that they're getting compensated for this. So they're getting well compensated for their videos. And it's just this, like, third-party ad service, which you can kind of think of as, like, commercials on a normal TV show. Um, What always feels a little bit less genuine to me is when you have, like, sponsored products or sponsored product placement or something like that in not even just, like, YouTube, but, like, bloggers or podcasters. Like, um, you know, it's been something that, I guess, as content producers, like, you know, we create this podcast every week. Um, we have never taken a dollar of like advertising money or like any service that we recommend, we truly recommend. And I always hate once people do start taking money because I'm like, well, are they really recommending this or are they only recommending it because they're getting paid for it? And then all of a sudden you just kind of start questioning them. And then, um, you know, and I think that's where it gets more tricky for me, where if you just are like, okay, and now for our like 30 second ad break, and it's just like plugged by a third party advertiser, that to me feels like you're not, you know, setting this content creator up as like endorsing this product or somebody that you feel like now you have this relationship with because you've been listening to their podcast or watching their videos for years and you should trust them now all of a sudden you don't like have that same conflict of interest I guess right and it's even worse than I mean the model we've had for the last 30 years on the tv network which was you have commercials which is the the ad rolls right before before a show or episode on youtube or anything and then you have 
the product placement. So it's like the they have the can of Coke on a desk. on right. Like watching that Law and Order SVU like episode, right? And they're just like cramming in like all this like logo and product placement. Or you have the person in the show like talking about this thing and like this is what I drink or whatever, um, right? And that that's kind of the dichotomy. But I feel like the relationship between creators on like YouTube or the you know people on Twitch or or people that have kind of like a more one-on-one is what what it feels like relationship with the audience um more so than like a tv show does i suppose right because they're just like there's no back and forth there with a commenting system and like you can donate to them and like they can react to that in real time it's a much more personal relationship between like the content creators on these platforms and the people that are observing them either in real time or uh, with patreon after the fact for like video on demand shows or or anything like that and so i it's to your point it's even a little bit more deceptive because you are putting more trust in what they say because that relationship is closer than realizing that you know this tv show is owned by this studio and they're definitely out to make money on you and sure they're entertaining you but they're like making a ton of money off of you watching their stuff right Um, well then you kind of find out that like there are youtubers out there that are kind of in that same camp where they're uh, like individual YouTubers sometimes are backed by agencies and a lot of what they like do and say is a persona that they've created. And yeah. then mm-hmm. like they're, they're really fueled by this agency that's kind of controlling this over you know, overall concept of like eight different YouTubers and they're all playing off each other and making money. And even like some of the scandals, it's like, those are all faked for more viewership to, you know, and I know like beauty youtubers are a huge industry right where like a lot of this goes on right and in the in the youtube world that kind of networking or those like groups of users that are controlled by the same kind of like direction are you know called multi-channel networks mcns right and those those it's a conglomeration of basically the concept of if you work with us we can connect you to other people that have larger audiences or other audiences where we can pe- pull people in together or we can connect you to places that you can't go, right? They're, they're promoters. They're mm-hmm. you know, a management agency, more or less. They don't really add a whole lot of value um, in the creator world, um, but they do right, give you some like networking benefit, I suppose. But what's interesting, though, is to your point where they're like, you know, basically those are considered more of a corrupt thing across the board now, or it's becoming to be like seen that way more. Um, these were really popular for a long time, but a lot of people in recent news have been really getting screwed over by these, a lot of creators. Um, Comcast actually started buying up some of those uh, multi-channel networks, right? And so <laughs> it's interesting. So like they've been really against like the whole YouTube model for a long time where like that was a creative platform and like they were going to direct, um, you know, videos in that area or new TV shows or any of the YouTube premium content or anything like that. But on the back end, they're like silently like buying some of this stuff up and um, right, profiting from it because they're, they're making all the money that's being passed through to these creators takes a pit stop at these like multi-channel networks and they end up taking a cut of it. So um, so it's all kind of rolling back up into the same kind of scope as, right, that's one of the companies I consider more corrupt than others in as far as, pro, uh, you know, profiteering. Right. Not necessarily corruption, but, like, really aggressive pricing and profiteering for what they provide. Yeah. Yeah, and so I guess um, YouTube is an interesting space, too, because, like, something I have a hard time with is some of the people, you know, sometimes when I watch people, it's like, all of a sudden, like, yeah, you, like you said, YouTube is now monetizing things as well, where you can have, like, your content channel or whatever, where only subscribers get certain access to different videos or Right, or, or it's like sub-series. a pre- premium tier for, like, that channel where you can get something else, like hidden videos or something like that yeah. for, you know, subscribing to the channel and there's some kind of monetary subscription. But what's crazy to me is, like, most of those YouTubers still leave ads in their normal videos, and I'm like, you're still making an insane amount of money. And now you want me to pay you more? Right. Like, that's where I have a hard time with it as a viewer. Yeah, and it's it's tough to know for sure how much some of the YouTubers make. Um, if, you're, if you're continuously in the millions of views um, or tens of millions of views, those people are definitely making millions of dollars a year. Right. Um, if you're in, like, the tens of thousands of views, it quickly drops off, right, and it all comes back to um, kind of – how many of your videos are monetized? 
uh, where YouTube is prioritizing you in the tree. Like it's not as straightforward as like an easy math equation for putting that together, but you can obviously the people that are toward the top of the platform are not losing any sleep over their finances. Yeah, I'm sure. And I, but I do feel like there's been a lot kind of that I've seen in the news recently about different YouTubers being like, well, I'm not paid like normal celebrities or normal TV show producers are paid or like how movies are grossed. And and so then they like make people feel a certain way of like, oh, they deserve to make more money because they're producing this content. But then I always like compare on the other side of like, or are we just paying the entertainment business too much in general? Because like, do do any of these people deserve to make like a million times what teachers make? Right. Right. That's, and that's exactly what it is. And so yeah. like that's the argument I always come back to is like they're comparing themselves to, you know, somebody else, but I'm like, well yeah, but why is what you're doing any more elaborate than any of these other professions? Right. And it's because they, they make the money and they can convince people to pay into Patreon and and everything like that. Yeah, and it, it I mean that, that's a probably a, an industry problem, right? Because there's a or not necessarily a problem, but it's a dynamic that is not equalized yet. So you have like this, these all these other platforms up here that are getting crazy numbers. If you were to compare these numbers of, of watch time and minutes watched and people watching these videos to like traditional television, it destroys traditional television, right? right? Nobody is watching traditional television. Nobody has ever watched traditional television in the ballpark of the numbers that are going into YouTube and Twitch and right like uh, any of these other video on demand services that are like basically are free at this point right and not i mean we're not even talking about netflix and hulu and like those things we're just talking about like youtube and so when somebody puts up a video that's 20 minutes long or 40 minutes long in like the stupid uh, Shane Dawson video cases. Or right? an hour and a half and there's, long like, There's Shane seven Dawson of those videos <laughs> and he gets like 30 million views per video or 40 million views per video, right? Like Game of Thrones like doesn't even get that kind of viewership, right? Right. Like that, it's like crazy amounts of like eyeballs on a space. So you run, when you're running an ad on that video, and the, whether it's a and he has like ads in his videos too right i don't know if he does or not but um a lot of youtubers can put ads in like the middle of the video so like every you know 15 minutes or 10 minutes or something depending on how long the videos are you can inject like mid-roll ads is what they're called in addition to the ones that play before and like after the videos also and so total watch time if you have like you know a few minutes of ads total for like a 25 minute video it's still way less of a percentage than it is in like the television world where like in today's like if you watch anything on tv it's like it feels like it's like 30 to 50 percent ads like depending on the show like I, I just always feel like i'm watching commercials if i ever turn the tv on um but right in the in the youtube space for the same amount of like viewership on those ads like they're not making nearly as much money in that same for all of the people that are watching that right but i guess my argument is like maybe we were just overpaying for that in the first place. Sure. Like, I definitely <laughs> think the advertising agencies in the television world are paying way too much to the studios for that airtime, right? And that kind of, like, snowballed out of control over time. But, like, there's a lot of people pouring money into that system. There's a lot of people making money out of that yeah. system. And it's just a big money-churning machine. That hasn't happened in, like, the YouTube, Twitch, digital, online media space yet. Um but there's a lot of people calling for like, hey, we want to make as much money or our ads should be making as much money as they do on TV. Right. And yeah, I, I agree. I don't think that's the right answer, but I think it's probably worth more than they're paying now. But like that just hasn't struck strike that balance out, right? Um, in the TV world, it's had time to mature or somebody got away with it or whatever. And in the YouTube space, like nothing has cost like any money for the last like 10 years because YouTube like in its infancy – like they were lucky to get any eyeballs on it, but now there's like millions of eyeballs on this stuff or, you know, billions of eyeballs per hour on all this stuff. And nobody's inflated the prices yet. Right. It's just, I think it's just hard as somebody, you know, we're a personal finance podcast. And so we talk about like financial independence or retiring early on, you know, the fire concept on several of our videos. And it's, so it's hard for somebody like me who kind of believes in those principles to think, of anybody being upset that they're only making, you know, five million a year or something, because I'm like, on five million a year, I could, you know, I could retire tomorrow. Um, so I think that's where I just always have that like catch of like, sure, you should get paid what you're worth, but you know, 
how much do you need anyways once you get to a mountain of money isn't it all just like a ridiculous amount of money anyways yeah but it doesn't <laughs> i mean if you're if you're the number one producer on that platform and that platform re- produces a certain amount of money right then right like there's an equation yeah, where yeah, you like you a, should yeah. get a cut of whatever that is yeah, right that's fair. um and it just depends on you know how much the advertising agencies are pouring money into that company. Right, right. And they have to um, find that valuable. And, and the valuation has to be there of, like, uh, you know, traditional television. If, you know, Chevrolet determines that if they run an ad during the Super Bowl and then they sell X number of trucks. But then, you know, YouTube's audience, I would say, is probably a lot younger, especially for some of the bigger channels. Mm-hmm. Um, their viewers are a lot younger. So some of these you know, spaces that have been traditionally taking up normal advertisements like car dealerships or, um, you know, Doritos or whatever. Like I'm thinking of Budweiser. I'm thinking of popular Super Bowl ads. It might not make as much sense for them to run, you know, to pour the money into it because maybe that's not the demographic that they're trying to target. And that's something else, too. Like, a lot of people do advertise to kids, but at the same time, like, you have to kind of have that balance and... But it's interesting, though, too, because, I mean, YouTube has a profile on everybody that watches stuff, right? Unless you don't have an account, I guess. But um, most people that are logged in have some type of an account. They have history on what you're watching. They know kind of who you are. They know your demographic information. And what would Chevrolet pay to not only just have, like, or any company, I guess, during the Super Bowl be able to target their their ad to a specific demographic, yeah, right? Yeah, that's so, true. Like, Chevrolet could target it to people that are like known for like looking up, uh, you know, buying a new car on their search history. Great. Target those people like that would cut. That would be so valuable in the TV space. Mm -hmm. You could like target it directly into their brain. But at the same time, like um, a toy store, Toys R Us, uh, bad example because they went out of business or whatever. But Toys R Us um, targets like kids in like a certain age range that have search history of like looking up like cool new products that they want to buy or whatever, or targeting new toys to those people. Because like, mar- it's no secret that like marketing to kids on TV since the '80s has been extremely profitable. Right, and I right? I think, <laughs> but then I think we get to the question of like, wh- when does advertisement become immoral (laughs) and I think you know Facebook kind of has been up against this a lot in the past year of like taking like at some point taking your private information and selling it to companies is wrong right and and so you know targeted advertising is a very scary thing because it it really is getting inside your brain and like making you more susceptible to buy these things because you're not just getting like the mixed bag of advertising you're getting ads targeted towards you and you're being like hammered in with this stuff that like maybe you care about a little bit more and I think that's like a really slippery slope and like leads us to a a kind of strange sad world of existence when when like you're being targeted to that level right and that's why the world of like turning on ad blockers to like get some of the stuff out of our face and uh, moving into a model that isn't as ad centric and like people just feel slimy and cringy once you actually pay attention to like your data is just like flowing out into the universe and somebody's making a lot of money off of it right Right. and like then they just turn that back and then like here's all these advertisements that come to you but i mean they're in 10 years from now there may be a world where we don't want to be advertised to anymore and we want to pay for stuff that we are consuming because this like free you know free to consume model is way less free at the end of the day than we right. think it is. That's true. And so, right, so that's where, you know, these platforms, it's, it's very interesting. Again, we're a financial podcast, so, and but we're also creators on this side, right? We create right. a podcast, we may be creating videos in the near future, like whatever, um, or whatever these platforms are in the future. Like, Whoa, who knows what, spoiler. Who knows what's going to happen. Videos coming. <laughs> um, but but w- it's just an interesting di- dynamic for, for our personal situation because, I would never recommend to people that they just like start pouring money into these systems. Right. And right, specifically for Patreon, the average um, output of money spent is $12 per person that they sponsor. But now, you know, I'll flip it because I actually really agreed with you of like, oh, it can be really hard, you know, if you're paying for all these contents and, you know, subscribing to all these people, like what you could start spending, you know, $50 a month. But on the flip side, if you are being targeted, to and advertise to very specifically and it's getting like this literally becomes a form of 
a mild form of like brainwashing, right? And then all of a sudden you're buying things that you wouldn't have otherwise bought, like new makeup or different coffee or a new pair of shoes or whatever, because these ads are coming your way or a new car in like the worst case scenario, you can very quickly start spending more money than that. Mm -hmm. So is it better to like have these advertising companies have all the power of like, they make the money, they do the ads. It's this cycle of like, obviously this stuff works or the advertising companies wouldn't do it right and so then like your people are spending money because of these ads and if we could just create a world where the advertising goes away and you spend money on what you choose to spend money on and then that includes certain content you know like my money in the bank or whatever um <laughs> you know then then we get to this world where at the end of the day you're probably still spending the same amount of money you're just not ending up with all this junk that was targeted to you, right? Right. You just end up with a bunch of stuff at the end of the day. Well, I, yeah. I or mean, I, obviously, or... you know, somehow that's working. Um, or, or you know, Taco Bell or KFC, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's all these ads that air, and and you're spending money on that stuff. So maybe at the end of the day, you start eating like more food at home and stop going, you know, out to eat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so there's there's no question to me that from a content creator, solely a content creator's perspective. It is so much better to receive money from my audience than it is to be driven from a large corporation that is saying, like, if you get these views, then if and if you meet these criteria and you're like family friendly and right, you have to be this, this and this and you can never uh, swear in your videos. And like if you have any Disney content then we get all this money out that's extra and all this other stuff. Right. There's there's all these like rules. It's so much worse for the content creator because they are shackled in their ability to produce what they want to produce, right? Right. So that takes all the creativity out of it. And then that encourages the behavior of like, I need to cater to the audience that is going to make me the most amount of money. Right. And probably that's going to be children. <laughs> right. right. Um, and so it's just like a, it's just like a terrible network for them. But if like I'm producing the content that I want to produce and it's interesting and I do it in a fun way that's captivating to the audience and I get to be creative in that endeavor and I really enjoy what I'm doing. And then there's like just people out there that want to sponsor me to do that because they enjoy watching the content that I'm creating. Like that's the ideal model for me as a creator. Like that's what I would be asking for by trying to get into that situation. So and so I think that could be a good model. But I think the other thing that can also be a good model is like, you know, Brett and I, we produce Money in the Bank every week. We literally don't ever care about making money off of this podcast at this point in our life. Um, but I think what is also another interesting concept is like we do have referral links out there. And if people, you know, people have chosen to go out and support us on some of these referral links. Like I don't have to pay for my phone bill for a year because we've had that much support. And that to me is like really cool. But it's like something that I would recommend anyways and I think is a good product. So I think I think another way if you And it don't, provided a discount to the people signing up for it. Correct. Also. Yeah. So it wasn't just like they just were doing it out of their kind of stuff. Right, 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 right. They were getting a deal as well. Right. But I mean I think there's a cool um, middle ground too of like maybe we take out these big advertising companies. But I also understand that like from being a personal finance podcast, there are people out there that I'm like I don't even want you to pledge like $2 to me a month because I would rather you take that $2 and like pay off your credit card debt, right? Right. Um, and so I think there's like a middle ground of like if we can find companies to work with like Google Fi, for example, um, that can offer my, v my listeners a discount and provide some type of kickback to me. You know, to me, that's that could kind of meet this best of both world where like I'm not slinging this stuff to you because I don't really care about making that much money off of it. Right. But if, when I find cool products that that fit this mold, then everybody wins. Right. But I think I think the problem is people get a little bit greedy as content creators or maybe not greedy, but, you know, it's also a big difference because this is not our day job. Um, and so when it becomes your day job, you're consumed with like, I have to hit certain targets. And then maybe you don't form as good of partnerships with the right companies. Right. Because when you hear, you know, I don't know, like Casper mattresses, right? And like everybody that I've seen on YouTube does a sponsored ad that does sponsored ads, like probably had Casper on there at some point. But if like you don't have a Casper mattress or, or like Squarespace is another big one, right? Like we use Squarespace personally. We've never like, you know, shield Squarespace on our site to like try and get people to use it because they're not sponsoring us or anything. But like we personally like the service. Um, 
But like, there's a lot of people I see on YouTube that are sponsoring Squarespace and they don't even have a website. Right. right? Like that, that's what I don't like. Well, yeah, I don't like that. Like, cause I can name them, right? It's like Squarespace, Casper, MeUndies, uh, <laughs> Blue Apron. Um, honey. I mean, Honey's Honey, big one, but Seat I, Geek. I, like there's all of these that are out there that people do, like, it, it's the same ones over and over. It's how these companies have chosen to market themselves. And, yeah, like, do I think that everyone's shilling, like, Blue Apron or HelloFresh, like, gets the subscription service of them? Yeah. yeah, of their own money? No, like, I absolutely don't think that. It, and do I think everybody's sleeping on a Casper mattress and wearing MeUndies? Like, I really don't. <laughs> um, I have a hard time believing that. So, like, that to me feels very disingenuous, but, like, You know, Mr. Money Mustache is somebody that we've talked about a lot on this podcast before, and he has a blog that actually makes him like half a million a year. The last figure I heard, I don't know if that's true. Don't come after me, Mr. Money Mustache. Um, But he has kind of done this by like, you know, he'll link up to like, like he had a partnership with like Betterment, which is like a way to invest in mutual funds at a pretty low cost with robo advisors. And um, he's recommended like credit cards before that have good cash back programs. And do I think that, like, he shows his Betterment account. Like, it's something he uses. And he's like, here's right. my numbers. Here's how it saved me money by doing, you know, some more intricate trading. Here's the credit card I use. And then they're, like, willing to pay him. So, like, I still feel like he's a pretty, you know, re- reliable source. And he also turned on Google Ads, which he admits. And he's like, but I tried to put them in the bottom corner of the website so they don't, like, interfere too much, Mm -hmm. you know? So so I feel like when people are open and transparent about how they're advertising to me, I don't really get that upset because I'm like, I get it. It's fine. Like, you know, Amazon affiliate links are another thing that if I, you know – respect a blogger, I will always click their links if there's something that I like want to buy that they shared because I want them to get that kickback. But so like those to me feel like not super intrusive and they're like pretty good ways to make a decent amount of money. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's different categories of people though, too, taking, taking this route. So you've mentioned a couple times the, the big ones that are making like actually, actually getting millions of views, but then there's a whole, that's not where most people on the platform That's are. That's true. That's where most people are watching people on the platform. But those people, right, they're, they're kind of like in their own category. Most of them have been around for either many, many years and have built up a following over a long period of time and like have kind of like earned the space that they've created for themselves or they're brand new and they just like, sh- you know, dump, jumped in the market and did something stupid to get like a ton of followers really quickly, uh, you know, game social media the best and like are – you know, flash in the pan type people, hopefully. Um, but there's the majority of people that are on these platforms, not many people are watching, like a few thousand people are watching, right? But they're still produ- like, there's still probably a lot of people out there that are producing like really interesting stuff, not getting as much like right. platform traction that is like yeah. throwing people in front of their face or their, you know, people's eyeballs to say like, come check out what this person's doing because they're amazing. It's just really hard to grow in that platform. Yeah. Those are the people that benefit the most because they're not going to get the ad dollars. Yeah. But they can get more money from the people that are like, yo, this is really awesome. You're a smaller group. I really appreciate what you're doing. Your information was super valuable to me. Um, and even though the platform doesn't recognize it, we do. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. And, like, I, I, I also think, though, like, if you're somebody listening to this who is – a content creator and you're trying to figure out how to monetize as somebody like I've kind of been in this content creating space for a while now because I actually used to have a decently successful running blog um, back in the day that I ended up shutting down but like you know I ended up it's I've never made a ton of money from doing this stuff because what really drives me is having a space to fulfill my creative outlet and trust me when I say like this podcast wouldn't we would not be here for going on we're almost on our two year anniversary, actually. We would not have been producing Money in the Bank this long if we were doing it to make any kind of money, because we really haven't. Like, this is the first year that we even really gained much traction with like referral links working well for us. Right, and for most content creators, it takes like a long time to build up an audience. There's a lot of word of mouth, right? You gotta get lucky sometimes. There's, you know, if you're gonna advertise on social media, that's a slow growth model as well for the most part. Again, unless you're one of those flash in the pan people um, that have probably a lot of money behind you and other agencies that are investing in you to like pump you up and make you look like something that you're not, right? On the back end. But 
right for for regular content creators that are starting this from scratch you either like get something that goes viral and you get a lot of traction and the platform recognizes you and you know pushes you out to more people and then you just instantly get like more success um or you take the slow path right yeah. and the slow path is more free um you don't have to worry about like your numbers every month as much you just get to be more creative um and ideally in the long run you just get to stay creative and people just like what you do um but it's 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 stressful and it's not as stressful at the same time right um because like if we had i don't know if we had two million people listening to this podcast every month i would try and say less stupid things maybe we (laughs) we probably would not have done a whole episode about how you don't shower (laughs) <laughs> how you told me not to shower that's the, the, real, the real truth um so anyways <laughs> we should start wrapping this up but i think ultimately kind of you know one of my takeaways here is like if there are small channels that are doing cool stuff and you have the financial means to support them via patreon like that could be a good model to pursue right um yeah i mean i i would feel less guilty about using an ad blocker on that platform if you're using you know if you're sponsoring those people in whatever other way but right, I I am a personal fan of like not getting spammed. I love running ad blockers. I hate ads on like 99% of sites that I'm a part of, regardless of what their monetizing strategy is. Um, but I do think it's super valuable if you do have the means to do so to support people where you know it is going to make a difference to their families. Right. right. And if they're making like a million dollars already every single day, then why do they need my dollar too, right? Like, right. do they need two dollars? Like, I, I just, it's like, I feel like I'm throwing my money away at that point. Like, why would I do that? Well, I mean, it's kind of like the epitome of that to me was when the Kardashians created their apps and it was like $1.99 per month to like download each one of their apps. <laughs> like, because it was like a subscription service. And I was like, yeah, Kim Kardashian doesn't need my $1.99 per month. Like, she just doesn't. Kylie Jenner, the world's like youngest billionaire, doesn't need my dollar ninety nine a month. Like to me, that was like kind of offensive. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you don't need this. Um, but yeah, you know, like there's certain artists I know that I've supported on Patreon before because they're like very small artists, and I'm like, I want you to keep producing music. Like you mm-hmm. know, you're you're good at this. So um, definitely like take out with a grain of salt. Um, in the effort of full transparency, we have no intent to try to monetize our podcast right now, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, We don't plan to like advertise you anytime soon and we don't have a Patreon. So um, we don't want your money. Keep saving it and getting that sweet, sweet compound interest. (laughs) That's that's the financial side of this conversation is your money is your money. Turn it into whatever you need to turn it into, Um, right? Uh, It's ill-advised to spend it on entertainment most of the time anyway. Um, especially when we're bragging about how we're like not using Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or any of those services anymore, um, and you know watching a lot of this stuff for free. So, uh, you know, both sides of the coin. It's just it's just an interesting conversation. I just wanted to talk about it and bring it up because I didn't think a lot of people were familiar in this area about how it's kind of changing and. Uh, what the current landscape looks like. Uh, So I thought it'd be a fun thing to talk about. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think this would be an interesting one to hear from other people, like, because we don't have a clear opinion on this of what we think is better necessarily. Um, So, yeah, are you for Patreon? Are you against it? Are you for ads? Are you against them? Or if Uh, you have donated, why, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a huge one. That's a a really cool one. Um, what, What was your motivation to, like, sign up and like make an account and like connect your credit card and all the right how did you go through that process because it's a lot of barriers to entry right and a lot of people are doing it right like in 2017 right i wish i had more recent data because it's already already been already a whole nother year so i expect that i expect for sure that they're over the two million dollar or two two hundred million dollar mark right um, probably through the system so um and I know the guy that runs Patreon. We we watched him uh, in the band Pobble Moose for many years before he started up Patreon. Right. Um, I think 10 years we watched this guy before he had the idea to start Patreon. So I, I like him as a person. I think he's a really cool guy. Um, and I think the platform like is out to do a lot of good for the most part. For sure, um, yeah. But, right, and they take a pretty low cut of like the, the retention for, you know, keeping the system up and running and all that stuff. They're not trying to really like make a lot of money off of it. But, um you know, it's it's your money. You should invest it wisely. And right, entertainment is is usually not a good long term investment strategy. So um, yeah, 
that you can't you know we, we got to have it both ways i suppose so i guess to relate it back to <laughs> stoicism uh seek not to be entertained <laughs> so there we go with my cheesy quote of the week That's right. um all right well thanks for tuning in like brett said if you have contributed to patreon um we'd be interested to i guess know why from some of our listeners out there if if you have and and why you choose to support smaller creators um or, you know, maybe if you even have a creative solution of like, oh, we think all of the current strategy is baloney and we'd propose this. Um, I'd just be interested to hear what people have to say. It's a very interesting topic to me. So, all right. Thanks for tuning in on Way Normal Wednesday. <laughs> hey, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Money in the Bank. Make sure to subscribe to us on the iTunes or Stitcher app so that you get weekly alerts every time we post a podcast. Or if you want, you can visit my website, moneyinthebankpodcast.com. And if you want to reach out with any questions or further comments, please email me at angie at moneyinthebankpodcast.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Money in the bank.